Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favourite podcast and becoming a patron, please visit patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast and help me with the Tough Girl mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All patrons get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. New episodes go live every Tuesday and Thursday at 7am UK time, so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking with Erica Tablanchi, who is an endurance runner and adventure racer, who is on a mission to share the joy of running. She's also the author of Run for the Love of Life. In the last 10 years, I've done a lot of uh, long-distance uh, endurance running. I've won a couple of the big, um, iconic seven-day, uh, especially desert races in the world. I am also an adventure racer and did um, a lot of adventure racing in my time and then also represented South Africa at the Adventure Racing World Champs in New Zealand I've also been a very keen advocate for people to get out into nature and into the outdoors, and especially for women. During my time in London, I live in Cape Town at the minute, and during my time in London, I spent 10 years there, I decided to start an adventure company that would take um, women to the edge um, of of endurance and adventure and started a kayaking company in Greece called Teach a Girl to Fish, um, which is quite extraordinary to see the adventures that people can have in the outdoors. And during this time, I also studied psychology. I did a master's degree in positive psychology. I've got several coaching qualifications. So I'm always very interested in this idea of how we can become the very best um, of ourselves and developing our skills, our resilience, our character, um, ultimately, and basically how sport and spending time in the outdoors and having adventures sort of become anvils for that process uh, where we chisel ourselves into the best creation we can be in our one precious life. So that's that's a short blurb. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of side Uh, branches we could take. Um, I also have a background in corporate strategy and sustainability, really understanding that uh, business can do a lot um, for making the world a better place. Yeah, so take it away. Take Take it away. Well, don't, we'll, we'll leave the corporate strategy for the moment and we will be focusing on the outdoors and the running and the adventure racing. But actually, I'd love to go back to your childhood. So you said you started, um, you know, your company called Teach a Girl to Fish. Did you fish when you were younger? You know, how, how did the outdoors play a part of your life when you were growing up? Yeah, oh, that's, that's mastery of podcasting. Thank you. I think one of my best and earliest memories was when I was about six years old and we were in a place called Storms River Mouth um, on the coast of South Africa and I caught my first fish. And Sarah, I can still remember that exhilarating moment of sitting alone on the rocks with my little fishing rod and the fish taking my bait and running with the line as a small six-year-old child catching my first bit of food. It was quite an extraordinary moment. And I grew up um, on a farm and spent a lot of time in the outdoors and from a very early age learned outdoor proficiency. I learned how to fish. I learned how to be and find my way, you know, in, in the wilderness from a very, very early age, how to navigate and not get lost, um, how to walk long, long distances on the farm. Yeah, and not to be scared of venturing out, you know, and going and doing things that other kids who maybe grew up in town and would be afraid to do. Um, but there was always something about um, being in the outdoors and having this extraordinary freedom and sense of adventure from the earliest age. I, I remember when I was seven years old, I took a friend of mine and we tried to survive for three days living next to a river catching frogs 
and trying to have that as as a meal. <laughs> Needless to say, it wasn't, you know, it didn't last very long. After three days, we went home. But I had that sense of adventure from from the earliest age, a wanderlust, if you can call it that. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I have a sister who's six years younger, and she was often an accomplice on my adventures from an early age. And my sister, in her own right, has grown up to become a climber, adventurer, and um, a nature lover, but in a different way. I think it's just interesting because what you said there is, you know, you've been brought up not to be scared of venturing outdoors. And I don't know if it's if it's been like later on or, or more recently, whereas sometimes I almost feel as though girls are, they're taught to be fearful of, mm. of, of risks and, and going outside and you've got to be wary and you've got to protect yourself and um, and girls shouldn't do that and it's not ladylike and it's not appropriate mm-hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But it sounds as though, you know, you had this openness and this freedom at even six and seven to go and spend time down by the river and cooking and catching your own food and just spending time out- outdoors. Did you ever become a, not not did you get taught to be fearful, but do you think you were taught bravery? You know, that's a really interesting question, Sarah, because when when in the process of writing my book, uh, Run for the Love of Life, every author that will tell you that at some point you can't just tell good stories. You have to tell about the bad things that happened. And in the book, I share some very difficult experiences, which will certainly suggest that the world is a scary place and some thing to be afraid of. But it's interesting. And I think my my mother and father were both two extraordinary role models where, I mean, my mother is the most fearless woman I have ever met in my entire life. And I think it's because of her role modeling that even when things were scary and even when bad things happened, to process through those rather quickly and you know, where the grit in the shell sometimes becomes the pull, you know, where difficulty and challenge and hardship and bad things that happen to us, if we make that choice, sometimes serves to make us stronger and more resilient and less afraid, strangely enough. So that's certainly been the case in my life. So I had parents who really allowed me my freedom who weren't overprotective. My mum was a fearless woman. And, yeah, so I. it's also very interesting, I think, that the more we tell people that the world is a scary place and if we raise our girl children differently to the way we raise our boy children, we instill fear even before anything goes wrong. And, and I really believe that that's a disservice to our kids I mean, I, I'm passionate about getting girls and boys out into nature and at an early age so that they can develop that very visceral uh, physical resilience. Because when you know in your body that you're strong, and if you know in your body that you can cope when it rains, or you can cope when it gets dark, or you can cope when you're lost and you're feeling a bit panicked and you have to find your way, and eventually you do, I think those lessons, uh, outdoor lessons, precipitate in a child's body and makes them more resilient in normal life, right? So that they're not scared to stand up in the boardroom. They're not scared to to venture out and do things that others uh, may be afraid of. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You met, you mentioned your book, which I'm super excited. It's going to be coming out on the on the fourth of November. And the title is, you know, Run for the Love of Life. I'd love for you to share where your love of running came from. You know, what's your running journey been like? Let me say that the running started rather late in my life. There was not a semblance of an athlete in me <laughs> when I started running. And I had uh, and I enjoyed a, a good glass of wine and trained maybe twice a week at gym half-heartedly. And I started running when I was 30, 30 years old. I had lost a bet with a friend, and she suggested that we do a half marathon the next morning. It was the next half marathon was the very next morning of the evening that I lost the bet. 
And I remember suffering through the first half of the marathon, half marathon, and then on the other side of the half marathon, I experienced a extraordinary sense of joie de vie. And I think that's maybe where the running started. But then I saw Mark Burnett's Eco Challenge on TV. And when I saw this extraordinary sport of adventure racing where you have teams of four people, typically one of the opposite gender, so it's mostly three guys and a woman, in these spectacular wilderness landscapes going for day and night and day and night without stopping, I suddenly realized I'd found my sport. I then recruited the lady who took me on my first half marathon and her boyfriend and brother, and we had our first experience of adventure racing. We did a 100-kilometer race. It was a 24-hour race, and at 3 a.m. that morning, I hit the high notes of endorphin release and euphoria (laughs) because you know we were in some crevasse um, on the mountainside under the starry skies and we had not slept for you know almost 24 hours and I just knew this was it so I went straight from that half marathon to doing five years of very intensive adventure racing and eventually became one of South Africa's top adventure racing women got recruited into the top team, uh, Team Cyanosis in South Africa, and then went to World Champs representing my country, which was really a great honor and an extraordinary journey from somebody who wasn't an athlete at all to someone who was able to, for five days and five nights, go without sleep and basically a mountain bike, canyoneer, run, sea kayak, river kayak, I mean, whatever they could throw at you, rappel, abseil, uh, whatever it was, you know, for for 500 kilometers nonstop in in wilderness uh, areas. And what I also discovered in that journey, you know, I was as interested in the extreme nature of the sport as I was interested in the psychology of endurance sport and really what happens to the human spirit um, at the far edge of of endurance. And it was fascinating, Sarah, because, you know, the longer we went, it sort of happened after about 48 hours, the women came on a par with the guys um, in terms of strength um, and, and physical ability. And sort of by day three of not sleeping at all and going nonstop, the women would begin to get stronger By day five, one would literally be carrying one of your team members' bicycle, making sure everybody was eating, checking in on everybody's physical state. If people had hypothermia, you were the one to make a fire or call for emergency procedures. And I often wondered about it, you know. And what I have uh, come to understand is that I think women are geared for distance uh, racing, for endurance racing. We are prepared for motherhood. We're prepared for nights and days without sleeping, looking after a very vulnerable little thing um, or a little baby. So it's it's interesting um, that that spills through in endurance sports and when women actually become stronger as, as time goes on. You talked about the the euphoric highs that you can get when the endorphins and the adrenaline and and it can be an incredible experience. I, I know I've experienced it myself while I was out running um, the, the Marathon de Saves out in, out in Morocco. But on the flip side of that, you can also have these depths of despair and like the black hole. And you talked about, you know, reaching that edge of your limits mentally, emotionally, you know, physically. And I'd love for you to share maybe a little bit more about your perspective of when your limits have really been pushed to the utmost and Mm. what you learn from going through that experience yeah so that's that's an interesting one for me the races and experiences and adventures where I could pick my own pace in other words where I wasn't racing against the clock or against somebody else I think were in many ways uh, easier for me and didn't um, push me to the edge. 
And in fact, I once ran 130 miles and at the end of the 130 miles, it was a 24 hour race. I really had the sense that I could still go on forever and ever and ever. And it was interesting. The format was such that you didn't know where the other competitors were vis-a-vis yourself. And I find that very easy. The races that I found really difficult were the ones where I had a very equally matched opponent or several opponents, and we were all racing each other. I find that extremely challenging and testing. And I would say probably the race where I came the closest to the edge of my endurance, I'd just gone into menopause. Um, I didn't realize it. But I lined up at the start of the Grand to Grand Ultra uh, in the Grand Canyon. It's a seven-day race um, across the most spectacular landscapes. And there was a young protégé runner, a Canadian runner. And at the start line, I write about the experience in my book, I saw her pawing the ground and I knew we were in for the battle of our lives. And, you know, so... Kelsey and I chased each other across those mountains and across the vast Grand Canyon for the entire seven days, basically being neck to neck for the entire race, both of us running at maximum capacity, sometimes for up to 18 hours uh, at an end. And I would really say at one point I thought I had, um, especially on the long day, so Sarah, you know, how these uh, races, you've done Marathon de Saab, so you you have four days of running, say, uh, 30 miles a day, and then you've got a long day where you run anything between 50 and 60 miles. And on the grand-to-grand long day, Kelsey came steaming past me towards the end of the day, and it nearly broke me. And the interesting thing was, what really carried me through, was just the sense of, just not giving up, an unwillingness to actually give up and just to grit it out and use every strategy that I could possibly muster, every positive thought I could muster, and just sticking to my own game plan and racing as hard as I could for as long as I could. So, yeah, I would say that was probably my hardest race um, and where I got the closest to to my own edge, um, if you will. Yeah. What what happened at the end? Who uh, who pipped who to the post? <laughs> oh, actually, no. Sorry, you'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> yeah, read the book, but you know, I'll 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 tell I'll tell anyway. So, um, yeah, in the end, I beat Kelsey just by the smallest margin. But there was a complication in in, in how it happened, and she had a, a slight misfortune as well. Um, uh, she she got a time penalty. And I really beat her by the the smallest margin. So it was interesting. It, it was a very interesting race. But it's better to read the story. Um, there's there's more to the story than I'm that I'm letting on. Oh, absolutely. Well, we've got we've got to read it now because oh my goodness, I could just imagine it. You know, like especially when it's neck and neck and this, these tiny margins, yeah. especially and these distances. You know, seven day races. You and 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 can I just say yeah. the, the chapter is called "Women Who Run with Wolves," and the the beautiful part of the story was I was old wolf, you know, on on the doorstep of menopause, and years Kelsey young wolf uh, really at the beginning of her racing career and you've got old wolf and young wolf neck and neck battling it out in 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 the natural order of things it was a good story it's a good story you mentioned as well about the strategies that you needed to use to grid it out to not give up to keep on pushing yourself and I'd love for you to share maybe just a a few of those strategies you know those practical pieces of advice so for for the runners and the endurance athletes listening they're like okay yes I can use that I mean the word there that I really want to double click on is pushing I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody who does endurance running is that when it gets hard is to take the foot off the gas. I think people beat, we, we beat ourselves up when we're not going X fast or fast enough. 
And there's an unwillingness to allow ourselves to actually just settle back and run slowly. And I found in my endurance running that when it gets really, really hard and when I'm beginning to feel that I'm failing myself, I throttle back and I make sure I eat and I make sure I take in enough salt and I make sure I take in enough sugar. I will go and I'll do a little walk until I feel better. So there's really something about um, going more gently uh, when it gets hard. I often see, especially the guys, uh, especially in the beginning, maybe the first 60 kilometers, what's that, the first 40 miles, pushing incredibly hard and not looking after their nutrition, in essence, not nurturing themselves, you know, and, and doing the right things. So there is really something about being gentle with yourself when you ask yourself to do something uh, really challenging and hard. So I'd say that's the first thing to to allow yourself to regenerate and then, you know, your mojo picks up again when you eat and when you take a little bit of a breather and then you can go just as strong as you as you started out at. Something else that I also really strongly believe in is to start slowly and finish strong rather than to set out the, the you know, the start blocks and kill yourself and basically destroying your race from the outset. Something else which is really, really important in distance running is that, you know, our thoughts can possibly be the heaviest thing that we carry. And you know, in these seven day races, you carry every single thing you may need for seven days. But the heaviest thing one could carry is a negative spiral of, of thoughts. You know, if you, if you do a distance race and you feel your, your eyebrows feeling a bit bushy and over dark, and you have a bit of a darkness in your in your mental space and you're worrying about either the race or work or something that's stressing you out back at home, you can just check in with your legs and with your body. The run feels hard. But if you can be very self-aware and notice that you are in a negative uh, thought spiral, is to literally turn it around. I mean, using hard mental discipline and taking those negative thoughts and sometimes they need to be there for a reason ask them what they want what they need for you to do to go away do what is needed and then replace those thoughts deliberately with positive thoughts think about somebody you love think about three things that you may be grateful for perhaps two things that you feel really glad about um you know, you could think about something nice that you may eat in an hour or the fact that um, tonight you'll be able to take magnesium and it will help for the cramps. Whatever it takes, think, think about something that excites you or something that you appreciate. And if you can get your mind into that upward spiral of positive thinking, it's really then that your, you know, your body begins to lighten and you get into a very different space in which to run. So that's that's really important. I mean, I have a million tricks up my sleeve <laughs> if it's hot, if it's really, really hot. And I'm talking about 50 degrees Celsius, you know, when the sky gets that molten gray color um, from heat. One very good strategy for cooling down, and it's something that I learned from the African elephants. Um, you know, the African elephants have these big capillary filled ears. and when they flap their ears and the wind blows over these capillaries, um, they actually cool down really quickly. So you may know this, our ears conduct a lot of temperature. And in the desert, I run with cotton gloves, obviously to, to protect my body against sunburn. But then if you wet the gloves and you cup them around your ears, and this would have been great for you in, in the Marathon de Saab, uh, Sarah, if you cup your hands just around your ears and you keep jogging, the airflow that runs through your ears and your wet gloves literally acts like a portable air conditioner and the ambient uh, temperature, the, your experience of the ambient temperature is at least two to five degrees um, lower than what it actually is. So that's another very, very simple tip um, for how to keep cool when it's extremely hot I mean, there are a million tricks. So 
if there's a distance, a long distance, say 100, uh, 100 miles, never think of the 100 miles. Break it down into small little bits. You know, so how do I get from from here to the next uh, checkpoint in six miles? And focus just on that, you know, and break the monster down into small achievable bits. I mean, I can talk for hours. I can talk about posture. I can talk about smiling because smiling puts your, your body in a, your parasympathetic nervous system in a positive state, whether you feel like smiling or not. And it produces endorphins and hormones that help support your performance. Sarah, really, this is, <laughs> this mean, is amazing. Unlimited, <laughs> unlimited stuff. In no. my book, I add a, I've added a QR code um, on the Ten Commandments of Running, and it really breaks down how to make running simple and easy and joyful and injury free. And whether you run five kilometers or whether you run a hundred, those principles still hold. So I can carry on for hours. Stop me, please. I'm, so, I'm stopping you. I'm stopping you. <laughs> But let me ask you about, you mentioned at the very start, you know, that you have this love for, for deserts and for running across deserts. And I know you've said you've done some pretty extreme desert races. Why deserts? Why the heat? What is it that you love about being out in that space? It's a really good question. And I think it's it's more of a spiritual answer, perhaps, than a physical um, answer, you know, the deserts are places where the prophets and the seekers and the pilgrims have all gone for transformative experiences. Um, there's really something about the desert that's quite extraordinary. It's um, a magic that is not visible immediately to the eye, but the more time you spend in the desert, the more one gets a sense of its beauty, its simplicity, and yet how incredibly rich it is. I mean, the the sands of the Sahara dunes, there's a magic there that I that defies description, uh, really. And when you are in a vast, open, unfettered space like that, I, I think the soul expands, your mind expands. There's a soul rest that comes from being in the desert that I don't get anywhere else, if I have to be honest. And the heat, you know, Sarah, when it gets to 50 degrees Celsius, one would think that heat is an adversary. And it's not like that for me. Um, it's almost as if though one can somehow step into the heat as a, as a friend, as the beloved, you know, and embrace the heat. And the moment you embrace the heat, it's strange. It becomes a comfort in a funny way. Uh, yeah. I always feel like when the sun comes out mm. and it starts getting hot and I can feel it on my skin, I literally feel as though it's charging my batteries up. Like the sun is empowering like my body and my mind and it's just incredible like I'm definitely more of like a sun and a heat person than an arctic and a, and a cold type of person but it's, it's quite interesting when you chat with other people who are like nope give me the cold give me the arctic <laughs> please no 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 I mean there's maybe two other things to be said vitamin d I, I think your point of being charged by the sun I don't know if you know this but I don't know what the official statistics are now. My doctor, I've got a GP friend in the UK, and she says 80% of her patients that come past her desk are vitamin D deficient. I think the official statistics stand on something like 52% of people in the UK are actually vitamin D deficient, which means you can't sleep properly, your mood is negatively affected, your eating patterns are negatively affected, your entire circadian rhythm is out. So I think this thing of when the sun comes out and it charges you heart, body and soul, I think there is much more to it than w what we know or what we um, in our practical daily lives allow. That's the first thing. And the, the second thing is I've got Raynards. Oh, yeah. So uh, Raynards is a, it's a 
a condition where the capillaries in your digits, so your toes and your hands, have a fright very quickly if there's any cold about in the in the environment. So if I take a tomato from the fridge, I will immediately lose the blood flow from my fingers and my toes. Secretly, I think, and I've never said this publicly, I don't even think I wrote it in my book, but I think having that condition in the desert is hugely helpful because maybe I can take more heat than other people and perhaps you are also genetically uh, predisposed to be able to handle heat better than than cold you know yeah. so different strokes for different people i suppose absolutely absolutely mm. I, I just want to go to go back you know so the chapter that you in your book is called you know women who run with wolves and you described you know the old wolf yourself and kelsey sort of the young wolf and with regards to the old wolf, wolf you, you briefly mentioned that that you were entering menopause or you or you've been mm. in menopause how has that impacted on your running and your adventures and your ability to continue doing the things that you love outdoors there is very little research on this. Uh, I find it frightening when you go into menopause and you, as a, an endurance runner, uh, want to navigate this new world. And I'm saying it's a new world because everything, and I mean everything, changes. There's very little out there to support women in this transition. And I really am going to make it my work to document and to make accessible what my personal journey was and I hope a body of knowledge will form around it from other uh, endurance runners going through the same. So I would say that since I've gone, I mean it begins in perimenopause in the five years or five to eight years before you go into menopause, you can slowly but surely begin to feel the effects of different things but as you step into menopause the way I can describe it is going to ride the Tour de France with a bicycle, but without any tires. You're, you're just on the rims of the bicycle because your estrogen and your progesterone disappears, and so does your testosterone. Your testosterone is a performance hormone, and with that is a lack of – so your, your physical strength begins to uh, reduce – Accordingly, with your estrogen going down, um, estrogen is related and regulated with serotonin. So serotonin is what keeps your mood. You know, you know how you feel uh, just before your period. Um, it is going into a state where you constantly feel like you're going into that estrogen low um, just before your period. And then progesterone is uh, correlated with your um, yeah, progesterone is correlated with your dopamine. And dopamine is the hormone that really helps you to be motivated and driven towards and fill in whatever dot, 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 towards whatever, the end line. The... So suddenly you do not have any of these performance hormones and you find yourself in a very different place. I've certainly experienced depression as I went into menopause and the shocking sudden a level of loss in my physical ability and also temperature regulation becomes very difficult because you get hot flashes so and that's a disaster for running in the desert and similarly I don't know exactly what the what the medical explanation for it is or the the, the biochemistry behind it but your VO2 max literally drops off a cliff. So for listeners, your VO2 max um, is basically the, the energy output um, for your particular lung capacity. An excellent VO2 max for a 50-year-old is not even a medium VO2 max. It's a poor level of VO2 max for a 30-year-old. So there's something that happens with your ability to breathe um, and to take in and transform oxygen into energy. So all of this has been really, really hard. And in the beginning, I thought that I would just really see what happens and not have any hormone replacement. And, you know, in the past two years, it's been really tricky because I still did some massive races. I did a, a hundred miler um, about six months ago. And 
really struggled. I did manage to come second in the race, but I really, really struggled to get through it. And Sarah, you know, in the past six months, what I've been doing is I have been looking at my regime of supplements. And now I am a hundred times more deliberate about the supplements that I take. I am draconian about my sleep. I am making sure that I get eight hours of sleep a day. And I am allowing this new stage of my life to create a platform for me where I am beginning to deliberately rewire my mind again to become even more resilient than I was before. So I'm very curious as to what will happen in the next six months when I come through this transformation process and I go into racing again. Will I be able to go further? Will my mind actually be stronger than it ever was? It's really interesting, but there's something about a deliberate process where you accept where you are now, you use every single thing that you possibly can that we know known to medicine to help support your body to maintain its performance. But it is really in the space of mental thinking where one has to rewire yourself to again feel fearless, to feel resilient, to to rise above um, this physically induced dip um, that, that one experiences. So I'm very excited and curious because I don't know what could happen. You know, it feels like I'm on a frontier and I'm really curious to see where it may go. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I really love how you put this, you know, how that you're excited about this being on this new frontier and excited to see where it takes you on this on this journey. I just want to take you back to to your book. So, you know, Run for the Love of Life. How was that experience of writing it, of sharing these stories and these adventures? And what was your goal and purpose with the book? The longest time when I think I was 13 years old and a teacher said to me, He was my Afrikaans teacher, and he said, Erica, the writers of the world, a writer is the conscience of the nation. And I still viscerally remember the feeling I had sitting in his classroom, you know, when when there's just a knowing. So I knew from the youngest age that one day I would write to try and help and make my corner of the world a little bit of a better place. So when I started uh, writing Run for the Love of Life, my initial um, aspiration was to share adventures, to share 20 years of endurance uh, racing and endurance running tips and how-tos and how-not-tos and the little bit I've learned, you know, as a way of imparting the knowledge that I've picked up. And what was really interesting was the process through which I went in writing about the book, I began to understand how much more adventure and running had meant to my life than I could possibly have imagined. And as I was writing the book, instead of trying to um, tell nice stories that took people on just a a pleasant and, and happy journey, I really, really opened up my life and my life experiences, you know, shared the highs and the lows, um, the ups and the downs, and and even the worst of times, in a way that I believe could be very helpful for people. Because through the book, I understood that no matter what happens to us, if we choose to approach adversity as a golden doorway almost, um, through which you can step, that it's a chance, a chance to shape yourself and to grow and to become really the best that you can be. When I understood that in the book, I could really bring that message through. And as I was writing the book, I understood also that these stories, as much fun as they are and, and transportive, and, you know, it's, it's a nice uh, travel novel as well, and there's a bit of a love story in it as well. But I actually understood that what the book was doing it was that it was heating up people's blood for their own hopes and dreams, that it was reminding people about the the excitement of the body when we are moving, um, when we are having adventures, when we are nature. And 
in a way, Run for the Love of Life became a call back to your own hopes and dreams, you know, so that you could actually step back into your own life in your fullest capacity and make the most of your life. And in, it's an, an uh, invocation, I think that's the English word, uh, the invocation to to make the most of your life and to start actually a, a, a physical practice, you know, an, an exercise regime or something. And at the end of the book, I invite people to join Thrive Run Club. It's global. It's on Facebook. And to just take the first step to begin, you know, whether it's couch to three kilometers, couch to five kilometers, couch to 10 kilometers, whichever of the programs it is, and just to take the first step to their best life. You know, that's that's what the book is really about and for. Oh, fantastic. So you mentioned um, Thrive Run Club, but I'd love for you to share, you know, your social media links, your website, where's the best place for people to connect with you and to find out more information about the book and Thrive Run Club. You can find me on thrive-guru.com. That's my website. You can link through there to the Facebook page, which is thrive underscore run underscore club, Thrive Run Club. And you can find me on Instagram under Erica underscore Tablanche or at Thrive underscore Guru, all on Instagram. It would be wonderful if you um, would join our community there because um, the more of us that are taking other people on this journey, the better. Um, and that's how we're going to share the message. So, Erica, I'd love for you to leave our listeners with final words of advice, final words of wisdom for other women who want to take that first step, they want to get into running, they want to get outdoors, they want to live their best life, what would you say to them? You know, Sarah, there's something really powerful about community. There's something about finding your tribe. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, um, go together. So... It was certainly my experience during lockdown with Thrive Run Club. We've actually got a physical Thrive Run Club in Seapoint. And the way that we helped each other to show up over and over again through the difficulty of lockdown, through the isolation, for the longest time when we were not allowed to see uh, and, and see other people and when we were in isolation, we would run together online basically. Um, we would dial in um, on WhatsApp and we would make sure that all of us are showing up and running together, even if we were apart. And people in Run Club tell me that during this really difficult time, having a community of other people, of other adventurers, really made it possible for them to show up over and over again. So I would say to women out there who want to start, find people who do this stuff. It's extraordinary. I mean, the trail runner community, the adventure racing community, the climbing community, the distance biking community will give the shirt off their backs to a newbie adventurer. These sports are not so much about performance. It's more about getting other people included and growing the community and there's always this huge heart of gratitude among people who have been doing this for the longest time. And we all want to give back. We all want to get other people involved. So my first uh, recommendation to you would be find your tribe of whatever adventure it is that you want to uh, follow and let those people help you over the first steps of inertia. But find your tribe is probably the first thing that I want to say. And then the second thing I want to say is do not underestimate how the first step and the second step and the third step accumulate. You know, it's like compound interest. Over time, with a consistent practice in whatever it is that you choose to do, it begins to change you and it changes you and transforms us to make us become the best we can be. Running over these past 20 years and adventuring over these past 20 years, have it's fundamentally changed me as a human being and how I show up as a partner, as an employee, as um, a boss. Just begin because every next step you take is a step to your best self. That was incredible. What a way to end the podcast. Erica, 
Thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast and sharing more about your life and your passions and your new book. I'm so excited for, for people to read it. But honestly, just best of luck with what the future unfolds for you. And I can't wait to follow along with all of your future adventures and challenges. Sarah, thank you so much. You are a wonderful host um, and you really go right in where the money is. So thank you. Um, it was such a privilege to meet you. And thank you for what you do for the world of um, of women adventurers. I, I think you're doing an incredible thing. Thank you. What an absolutely inspiring episode and a big shout out to all of the runners who are listening to the Tough Girl podcast while they are out on their run, whether it's a 5k, a 10k, a half marathon, a marathon, or you're going further than that. So well done. Keep focused, keep running, dig deep. You've got this. Just want to share a couple of other episodes, which I think you'll really enjoy listening to as well, especially if you are into running. I always think there's a lot that you can learn from endurance runners with regards to the mental resilience, the mental toughness as well as the practicalities of how are they training how are they fueling their bodies so just looking back over the past um past couple of months if you haven't listened to these episodes already please do go and give them a listen take a listen to verna volker who came on the tough girl podcast on the 25th of september she's from the navajo nation she she was a non-runner who basically changed to become an ultra runner it took her 12 years but now she is a native women's running and hocker global ambassador I'd also recommend that you take a listen to JC Ho. She's one of Hong Kong's top ultra runners. She won the VMM 70K and was the Hong Kong 50 series winner in 2018, 2019. Really, really fascinating about her start in ultra running and how she ended up coming last in a race. And then she went back a couple of years later to win it. She also talks more about sort of her fear of running downhill and how she's trying to overcome that. Take a listen to, who else can you take a listen to? Well, the two answers, hundreds of women that you can take a listen to. Um, Sophia, take a listen to Sophia. She's an ultra runner, fastest female to run from Kashmir to Kan- Kanakumari, which is 4,000 kilometers, which she did in 87 days. And she also ran the Indian Global Quadrilateral Road, which is 6,000 kilometers in 110 days. That episode came out on the 10th of August. She's also got an incredible challenge that she is currently planning for as well. I'd also um, encourage you to take a listen to Dora Atim. She's a running coach and founder of Ultra Black Running. She completed the Speed Project. She's actually done it twice. And the Speed Project is a 340-mile relay race from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. I'd also encourage you to take a listen to Dr. Catherine Ganley. She's actually um, had two episodes on the Tough Girl podcast. One is focused on her being a doctor based out in Antarctica. And then the second one is based on her endurance running so she's done challenges like spartathlon the dragon's back race the grand union canal race she's also done the the centurion four 100 milers grand slam in 2014 and she also did the marathon de sabs in 2013 again loads of top tips really fascinating pieces of advice you can also take a listen to angela white who's also known as the running granny she completed joggle so running from john o'groats to land's end in the uk 870 miles she did it at 60 years old at that time and she did it in 18 days 10 hours and three minutes uh brooke thomas running with a heart condition the nurse who broke the woman's record for completing the tuaroa trail in new zealand in new zealand 3,000 kilometers in 57 days so we've got a whole variety of different runners different distances different challenges to take on so please do take a listen to any of those episodes and all of this information can be found at toughgirlchallenges.com which is basically the main central website go and check it out there's more information about me my different challenges so one of my running challenges is uh, the marathon to Sards, running six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert I've also done um lots of through hikes from the Appalachian Trail to the Camino Portuguese to the Overland Track in Tasmania and I recently completed the UK Adventure Series which was supported by Cicerone but there's uh, there's a blog on my website as well there's uh, information about different books that I have uh, written or been involved with as well as all of the episodes so there's over 500 episodes of the Tough Girl Podcast which is absolutely amazing I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the patrons and supporters I could not do this without 
about you. You are fundamental to where the Tough Girl podcast has got today, got to today, and where it's going to be going to in the future. If you've been inspired by the Tough Girl podcast, if you've been motivated by the Tough Girl podcast, if it has changed your life in some way, then pay it forward. Supporting the Tough Girl podcast from five pounds a month, ten pounds a month, fifteen, twenty pounds a month makes an incredible difference. We, you are, you are able to support in sterling, US dollars, euro, Australian dollars, pretty much any currency available. You can do it monthly or there is an annual option as well. So please do go and check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. New episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, 7 a.m. UK time. And all my runners out there, keep running. You are doing so, so well. The hardest bit is the final push at the end, but you have got this. I believe in you, so please believe in yourself. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.